therapist. And yeah, I'm really interested in, in the subject of vitality. Um, I want to ask a question, first of all, before we actually start to go through um, and maybe discuss vitality from West perspective, but also from an Eastern perspective. Um, I want to ask you guys what you consider vitality to be. Anyone, just uh, please, either you can speak or you can, have we enabled speaking? Um, you can speak or you can actually type into chat, whatever you think, just, just any ideas you've got about vitality. Everyone can unmute themselves if they want to, or feel free to share in the chat. Well, for me, vitality is energy, longevity. Vital en energy and longevity. So you've got the idea of energy and also longevity. So there's something there with energy and also longevity. So that's interesting ideas. Anyone else, please? I love it. It's those moments. It's like, you know, everyone's kind of like, um, full of life force. So Suzanne's full of life force. The ability to live and thrive with ability. energy. Well, I don't know. With natural energy. Ability to live and thrive, natural energy. Anyone else? Guys, you're going to have to help Collins. I'm not allowed to give my definition until the end. Or well, the end of this session. Yep, I'm going to leave you hanging for an hour. Oh, don't do that. Anyone else? Carol, Matthew, Aga, Yitka? Paul? I'd add kind of a, in like, just kind of like full of life force, but like an enthusiasm. Like there's like certain people who just seem to have like a force of nature who just kind of go into a room and kind of just not necessarily light up a room, but they've got so much energy and enthusiasm and positivity kind of about them that kind of uh, that's you often kind of feel that kind of from other people, from certain mm -hmm. people. Okay. So, um, if we just so before, thank you, thank you so much, guys. So we've got this idea of energy, um, longevity, full of life force, ability to live and thrive, um, natural energy, um, having strength and energy from Matthew, um, enthusiasm, force of nature, energy, enthusiasm. Again, I, I find these, I find all the words very interesting, but they're also quite connected. Um, so this concept of vitality. I mean, I want to know what it is. First of all, I want to know what it is from an Eastern perspective. I want to know what it is from a Western perspective. I ask a question, where is it? You know, where is vitality? Because that for me is also kind of like an interesting idea. Where, where is vitality? Is it physical? Is it something that is mental? Does the mind influence it? Is it spiritual? Does it have a connection with spirituality? Um, what do we do to actually maintain vitality? How can we lose vitality? How do we increase vitality? Um, how does it get eroded? And what are the signs? Is, is there something, you know, is there a link with, with burnout? Does it get depleted? Can you rebuild it? Is there a relationship with resilience? Um, you know, for me, there's quite a lot of questions around vitality. Is it a privilege to have vitality um, or does trauma attack, you know, affect vitality? So for me, there's kind of like a, a number of different ideas that um, when, I, when I'm thinking about vitality, I'm, I'm starting to reflect upon. Um, and I, what I want to do is sort of begin to begin to unravel this from a an Eastern perspective, but also from Western perspective. So can I hand over to Stanford from Western perspective? Can I ask you to begin to define vitality from a Western perspective? And then we'll start to begin to unravel it a little bit more to answer some of these questions. Sure, thank you. And it almost sounds like from your introduction, we're gonna be here for the next three hours. So I'll, I'll, try, to, I'll try to be brisk. So when I, when I look at vitality, I, I come across a lot of the description and, and definition that you guys have given already. Um, it kind of cynicism with being animated, animation, uh, exuberance, uh, even like jazziness, liveliness, um, robustness is another word that I come across. And I think 
personally, the definition I'm most connected with is actually uh, vitality is what distinguish um, between living from the non-living things. So literally is the vital force of energy that we have inside that define us away from the inanimate um, objects. It's kind of like a capacity for us to live and grow and develop. Um, but also I find one sentence that I really, really, again, personally um, enjoyed as well as related is the capacity for survival that is for the continuation of a meaningful and purposeful existence. So it's not just the breathing and living and blinking your eyes, moving your arms. That, that wasn't the only thing that seems to be the essence of vitality is also having a meaningful and purposeful existence. So we blink our eyes for a reason, we breathe the air for a reason, we move our arm for a reason, we speak the words for a reason and a purpose. And that, that is such an interesting concept because not only is medical, it's very much medical as, you know, Western medicine for decades and centuries and millennium, um, trying to extend human life for as long as possible. That seems to be the purpose of a lot of medical practice. But at the same time, it's hugely philosophical. Like, what does it mean to have a meaningful and purposeful existence? I think that is definitely one of the biggest question in life. It's kind of, you know, if you follow and believe in Freud or go along with the school of Freud, self-actualization is kind of like the top tier once you satisfy your basic living need, your physical need, emotional need, sexual need, and like that, that final step of spiritual growth and actualization. It's kind of almost there's a huge element of that in here as well. And I, I, I looked also into Eastern medicine or Chinese medicine into the vitality where that it, it kind of correlates at that a little bit, but that is slightly different. So I'm going to dive, dive into that a little bit later just because otherwise I'm, I'm going to get very, very muddled. Um, but I, before I hand it back to Colin, I will say, because of the definition I quite like how vitality distinguished the living from the non-living, I then kind of, dive into another search and I come across some um, saying or teaching or life lesson of Malawi's elder. So they say um, in order to kind of distinguish someone who is dying, there are signs. So the signs are uh, if you're losing weight fast, if you are losing your strength, if your speech becomes less emotive and you're kind of less the poverty of speech, when the breath become more shallow and labored, uh, when your face is less animated, um, it's more blank and empty uh, in terms of the emotion and affects, uh, you have less interaction with people in general. But the most interesting, it actually has a, a cold armpit. So first question of the night for Colin, why is cold armpits related to vitality? Okay. Uh, Thank you for starting that way. I mean, obviously, I, I wanted to sort of give a, a wonderful description to you about how yoga views vitality. Um, but obviously, I'm going to start with cold armpits. Um, <laughs> what a trap. You are welcome. <laughs> Thank you, Stanford. Um, but interestingly enough, um, when I was I worked in a hospice for five years, as you know, um, and one of the most interesting things for me wasn't the cold armpits. It was actually something different. Um, we, we, we used to um, we used to go around, we used to sit with people in, at end of life and I'd hold their hand and we'd talk and we'd do lots of you know, different things, oft, often things that you wouldn't expect people to do. But there's one sign of vitality that is, can be seen in the hands. And it's the moon of, the, you know, the moon, you know, that crescent moons? Sorry, my nails, I've, I've been mucking out horses today. So I've got mucky nails. So when you look at this, I'm really sorry. Um, but you see the moons. If you look at the moons, all of your fingers have got moons on, on the nails. Now, when the moons, according to tradition, when the moons go, your energy, life force, vitality has gone. Seriously, so I promise you, when you see it, um, end of life, you'll say, uh, you know, I'm, I've worked a lot at this stage. When the one on this, on the thumb goes, it's gone. It's very, very interesting. And I, I try to find a flaw with this again and again, this theory again and again. Um, and this I know, but the cold armpits 
I don't know because I never went to that stage where I put my hand on someone's armpit at end of life. I'm sorry. So this is I just have to be really honest about this. Um, but what I'd like to do is, is before I before I while I recover myself from this very gracefully, thank you, Stanford, and I'll get you in a second. Don't worry. Um, don't worry. I'm, I'm coming for you. <laughs> um, what I'd like to say is, is it, according to yoga, there's this kind of three things that become very important. Um, one is the um, an individual's constitution and the and the state of their constitution with regard to vitality. The second is the mind the mental emotional constitution that is also important for vitality and the third is a, a another area which is the life force which they define in a particular way which is a subtle expression of our consciousness and this is called prana according to yoga tradition now why this becomes very interesting is that we've got according to 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 their belief you've got consciousness that doesn't actually sorry lauren said something they kept looking at her toes interesting she looked at her fingernails because <laughs> you've got them on the toes as well they're quite they're, it's interesting they've got them on the toes but the fingernails for me are the biggest sign and according to our evader, these are the ones we look at as well. Um, according to, so back to where I was, um, according to their belief, you've got a number of things. One is you've got consciousness, which is, it just is. It, it doesn't move. It doesn't do anything at all. You've got consciousness on one side and you've got the material world or matter on the other side. And when these two come into contact with one another, which is what your wonderful story was talking about, um, Stanford, with regard to living and not living is the moment that consciousness comes in contact with matter there's like an electric spark now this electric spark they call prana and this is the source of life force and it's the source of vitality so it's not the vitality itself but it's the source of the vitality because the vitality plays out through the matter but the source of it comes from the prana does that make any sense Stanford? So it's, it's kind of interesting because we think that the prana is the vitality, but actually the prana is the, 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 the spark of electricity between the two, these two things, according to their thinking, that then creates this kind of, this, this force. So prana is, 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 is known as the life giver. It's, it's, and it's through effort that actually it kind of, it, it moves and extends. And prana is the thing that actually moves through the whole body. So if we define prana, it's defined as that which moves all around is called prana. So prana is something that moves all around. It has to actually move. So it comes into contact with matter, thanks to consciousness, and moves all around. So it's, it's known as a life force. Um, so this for me is the kind of the beginning of understanding about vitality. And also what becomes quite interesting is that it's, it's, a, it's a very, very subtle thing. And this for me means that it influences the mind and it influences the body. So the mind and the body are both connected with regard to vitality and they have to be connected. They're not dealt as separately. So rather than working on a body level or working just on a mind level, there's a connection between the mind and the body. And what, they said in some of the ancient texts, they said that where the mind goes, prana goes, this life force goes, and also the opposite way around, where prana goes, the mind goes. So there's a conscious aspect towards this. So this for me is the basis of beginning to understand vitality. Um, it, it means that the the it, it, it's prana is free to move around and it, it actually brings the quality of consciousness when it moves so it's the thing that brings consciousness when it moves so it means for me that vitality is very much linked to consciousness 
is very much linked to a state, a deeper state of being. So this, for me, mirrors what you're saying, Stanford, with regard to our purpose in life, with regard to our energy, with regard to our strength, our activity, our well-being. It kind of it links all these things together. It's why I start to ask the question about resilience. Um, and the question for me is that, is it the power and energy behind things? And if it is, how does it start to manifest itself into a body to, or a mind to start to do this? Why does it, why does vitality drop? Why, why do these things occur within people? Why do, why do people lose a sort of almost, uh, they, they lose their energy? I don't know why, why does this happen? Um, according to you, Stanford, I mean, can you go back and explain the cold armpits first and then discuss just a little bit more about vitality? I don't have an explanation for the cold armpit. I think we might have to ask the Malawi or Malawians. Um, the only thing I can really think about is the armpit is really quite close to like your core temperature more. So mm -hmm. when when you are losing that sign of life, you would slowly lose the ability to heat your body. So maybe your ability to kind of maintaining your core temperature to be a certain level kind of goes. And that maybe is why you have co -ampers. I don't know, that, that is why I asked you, I didn't actually have an answer to that one. Um, but I very much agree with the <laughs> nail um, observation. I think as part of medical school, we're always been told like one of the first part of examination always should start with the hands and most importantly from the nail because any chronic disease you can see in your hand, like a clubbing, which means you slowly lose the angle of um, between the nail bed with the skin part and the actual cuticle part, or, you know, you can have discoloration, um, you can have chip nails, you can become like spoon shape, like there's loads and loads of things you can look just by observing other people's hands. So actually I completely agree that you know that's a very very good place um especially if you want to get to know the other person a little bit physically speaking and even mentally speaking and now that you said something about nail it actually reminds me um my mom used to tell me you know sometimes on your nail you have these white bits that seems to that she told me so this is not according to any medical system but because she's my mom obviously she's the most correct person in the entire world um these white spots um marks whenever you have like a major illness so you know whenever you look at your nail and there's like a little bit of white line there or white blob i would say that um that is actually you say that you just had that period of time when that nail is growing out from the nail bed you have a illness so I don't know. I call him my correct me on that, but I won't correct my mum. Um, <laughs> I, I like your. It's, it's interesting when you say that because we look at it um, from our perspective. We 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 agree with your mother because we actually say there was a, a, a deep issue in the digestion at that point in time, and of course the digestive system is associated firstly with vitality, but also it's associated with numbers of other things that are going on. And so your mother at that point in time is completely correct. There is, there is some, there is something going on within the digestive system that means there's a manifestation in um, the excretion of the level of the deep excretion of the level of the bone in the system, which the nail is. It's it's a it's an excretion outwards in this way, and there seems to be some kind of imbalance at a digestive level with regard to this. Thank you. I'll go back and tell her that she's right. She'll be overjoyed. Um, Does that mean she'll like me? <laughs> I think so. I think so. I'll let her be the judge. Okay. <laughs> have I lost Stanford? I think you have, yes. Okay, so this is where I tap dance and jump around. Oh, and bit. then the prana, the energy is kind of the thing, the direct. Can you hear me? No, yeah, you're back again. Yeah. You, 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 I'm back. <laughs> you went. I know, sorry. Um, so what I was just saying. I was, ent I, I was entertaining everyone whilst you were away. <laughs> when I'm mining, yeah. sorry. Yeah. <laughs> um, I was just saying, I really enjoy how you kind of, from my understanding, my uh, prana is almost like the direction for the ever-moving body and the ever-moving mind. And prana is the thing that gives it direction and almost kind of how I said or how I understood from other texts is the meaning and the purpose of, you know, the movements and the existence and why we are living compared to the non-living. And, and the reason why I, I also find it very interesting is while I was doing the research 
there seems to be a lot of old texts that seems to suggest human used to live a lot longer. And this is both from the East and the West. Like if you look in the Eastern philosophy or you know, fairy tale stories, fables, there are all often people who live for hundreds of years and these are like the, what they call uh, call the true human, like I'm translating literally from Chinese, where they where they kind of gone a step level, they're no longer just the practice person and the um, kind, of, uh, kind of the hermits who go to um, do a lot of self-reflection, self-digging, and then getting stronger and better in every single way possible. But they are like the true human, they truly evolve themselves and they live for hundreds of years. But also if you just look at, I don't know, the Christian Bible, the Judaism Bible, people live for hundreds, maybe even thousands of years. And then seems to be a belief, apparently very common prior to the beginning of 19th century that uh, we believed human lifespans used to be much, much longer. And now over time, it's slowly being lost and limited. And the aging seems to be in some way accelerated or, or ability to counteract aging seems to have been lost. Or we can't maintain the vitality. And I, I, don't, I didn't find much explanation about that. I don't know why that was a philosophical belief back then. Um, the only thing that I kind of have more understanding towards was um, it seems to over time over the last you know two thousand years plus the density of our population seems to be bigger and bigger and we seems to live in closer and closer proximity with each other and that that increase for a very long period of time and, and up until recently um, or currently a transmissible disease is very much a thing that limit human life. And that may be one, um, and that kind of explained my fairy tale story a little bit because these people who used to live for hundreds of years seem to be always a hermit figure, and they live in the mountains, they live in the nature, and they kind of live outside of a larger society. Um, so I, I don't know, it's a slight, slight detail from the medical model, but that that I thought was very interesting, and I wonder if in like the historical yoga and Ayurveda texts there was any such correlation as well. I like your fairy tale. Um, I really do, because almost in a way, um, the, the battle or the chasing for anti-aging or the fight for longevity has always come with a curse, I think. So within all of the sort of the, the myths, it, you know, that it comes with loneliness or it comes with some kind of curse that comes with this sort of this, um, either the search for longevity or having longevity. So I, I don't know if you, you understand what I mean by that. It's it, within, yeah, like the vampire. So there, there's all these kind of, there's these sort of, it, it, there's something that comes with it that isn't quite right. Um, according to, I would say yoga and Ayurveda, the maximum lifespan possible is 120 years. So that they're saying that that's the maximum possible lifespan of a human being. And what happens is that you have this kind of full container of 120 years and every, different occurrence in your life that disturbs that starts to erode at the end of your life sort of backwards but for me quality of life which we've discussed becomes quite important because I think to have longevity you can have 120 years but if 40 of those years are, are, are kind of like in a bed with a load of tubes attached to your arm it's not much of a quality of life so for me the vitality longevity and quality of life need to come together so life needs to be worth living, you know, and the vitality needs to make you live life. And in fact, what you've opened up is an interesting thing is that all of yoga's practices are associated with harnessing the natural vitality of the body to go in the opposite direction to prevent the inevitable from happening, to make sure that your life has the most, I would say the, the, the optimal opportunity based on your mental and physical constitution to live. So for me, vitality is about living. 
and it's about living the best possible life and quality of life that you can live. So it's almost harnessing the power and the energy that you have and utilizing it for the best. Now, when we talk about energy moving around, we talk about prana and extending prana and moving it around. Quite often we talk about breathing and breath is the food for prana. So it's actually the food for prana, because when you're breathing consciously, it becomes the process of allowing you to begin to extend the natural vitality of the body. And so all of yoga's techniques, when we start to look at breathing techniques, we start to look at different mudra techniques, banda techniques, all of them are about increasing your vitality and increasing your energy. And they're all about destroying the deep mental toxicity which prevents your vitality. Does this make sense? Because for me, the, for me, toxicity, and, and I don't know what you know, Stanford, I don't know what you, you think about this with regard to, you, you've mentioned disease, but for me, disease is in two categories, as, as, as I think with you as well. It's physical disease, but also mental disease. And for me, both of these are toxicity. And they're toxicity that prevent the sort of this natural flow through the body and actually reduce the vitality of the body. I don't know what you think about this as a, an idea. Well, as a psychiatrist, I definitely agree though, that are definitely a disease and illness to the mind. But I think where, where Western medicine are getting more and more in tune with nowadays is how the physical and the psychiatric or the mental health disease are linked and coexist and actually is equally important. I think for quite some time we have focused a little bit more on the physical illness and physical disease for a couple of centuries maybe a little bit more um so yes but i I've, i really agree that both can interfere with our vitality and both can chip away as you said the vitality and that's why i kind of like the fable and wanted to bring it in because you know in a western kind of philosophy or theological um, studies in the past that it has similar concept where vitality is kind of like something that I think as Della have said has been given by nature you know it was we kind of inherent or we born with it and then slowly it got chipped away or taken away and that's very much within the Chinese medicine philosophy as well and I, I, I when I first researched about this I I I find it quite difficult to comprehend with the Western, the current Western medicine model, because we seem to focus a little bit more about freeing ourselves from disease and illness. As we shared, I think in the quality of life model, it, it, it doesn't quite focus on living well. It doesn't quite focus on enriching our life. That seems to be, I don't know, the parents' job or the school's job or, you know, the social club, a little bit more um, communities. Um, job is not very much in, within the health model um but now once we said that maybe freeing ourselves from the disease and illness is also part of that is slowing the chipping away of that inherited fixed amount of vitality but maybe we just need to open up and expand on the disease and illness a little bit more and I'll give the example of that of a patient I've seen today where I just was providing some therapy and he's a lovely teenager who, when he was younger, he's, he'd been diagnosed with attention deficit um, hyperactivity disorder, so ADHD, commonly known. So they're basically someone who are jumping around all the time, have loads and loads of energy, has loads and loads of um, impulsivity and like talks a lot, distracts everyone, always want to be center of attention. But then I think kind of coinciding with the lockdown period, they, um, not they, he, um, slowly become more and more withdrawn, more depressed and starting to have more like kind of self-harming thoughts. Uh, very good in a way that he kind of now come to terms with his depression. Um, now that he accepted and he had kind of, except to how, who, how and who he is now, what his mental state is, and how is he presenting to the world. But I think there's a lot of trouble how the world is seeing him, because for a teenager boy, especially someone who used to have, or who still have the diagnosis of ADHD, 
people expect him to be a lot more lively. And he seems to have, as we were discussing today, he seems to have lost a little bit of that vitality that he used to have or he should have. And, and today I was thinking when I was talking to him in our therapy, it's like how you accepting your mental state now is great, but at the same time, how can we help you to assess that vitality a little bit? Because in some way I don't want that disease or the illness or the state of the mind to chip away off his energy so much that it's gonna almost limit either his enjoyment or his achievement or having achievement of a meaningful and purposeful existence. I still haven't got the answer. I was still going uh, ongoing therapy, but then, but what you said kind of just remind me of that clinical example. No, it's it's interesting because it, it, it's this energy is an essential life force. I mean, it's it's a vital life force, and it's a force behind vitality, and it it, it actually makes things vital. But for me, there needs to be some kind of space. There needs to be some kind of space for vitality to occur. And I think that for me is important because what if you think about what we've discussed before about relationships, you've got a relationship with yourself, you have a relationship with the world, you have um, other people have a relationship with you. And so when we're looking at vitality, we're looking at not just something physical, we're looking at processes that are happening and for me vitality is the smooth movement of the processes working in the way that they should work unhindered so it means that if i eat let's say i saw someone today and i said how was your weekend? And they said, well, we tried to find somewhere to eat, but actually we had the power cuts, everything was closed down. I says, what did you do? So I went to McDonald's, she said, and we ate at McDonald's at 10 o'clock at night. Oh, how did you feel? I didn't sleep all night and I felt absolutely awful. And then I got food poisoning. And so I look at, it's what we put into our system physically the process of how it goes through the system. So how the constitution manages what goes in and is able to process it, how it metabolizes it, how it either holds it in, how it either rejects it and throws it out. Like I've got food poisoning. It's rejected it. It's thrown it out. You know, it doesn't want it. It wants to get rid of it. It wants to maintain its vitality. So it's rejecting the substance. Um, for me, it's not just this, it's about this happening on every single level. What I mean by level of domain is physically, this is what's happening. Functionally, so the, the prana or energy, its function is to take something in, to choose what to hold on to, what to let go of, what to assimilate, what to circulate around the system. That's the function of prana. That's prana's function. If what happens is that we block something from coming in, we start to get a disorder. Okay, let's say I don't want to have anything to come into my system. I stop taking things in. Or let's say I can't decide about what to hold on to and what to let go of. I might just turn around and get some kind of issue in the digestive system. So this will affect my vitality, will affect my energy. Now, if this is happening on a physical level, isn't there a mirror within us about what's happening mentally with the emotions and the feelings that we have and how we take those in and how we process them as well? Isn't there a link with regard to our vitality, our energy? Like, let's say, I don't know, can I ask a question to all you guys? Um, can you guys remember? going on a date with someone and being just like so excited that you just didn't, couldn't eat a thing. And you were like, oh, I can't eat. And you know, you go out for dinner with someone and you sit down and you go, I don't want to eat. We just want to talk. And we do like, and your energy just goes like, you know, the whole thing just goes, and I, a few of you going, yeah, I remember those days. Mm -hmm. 
<laughs> we need a few more of those. No, but, but you know what I mean? There was this, it, 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 something went like this. There was this kind of big opening that occurred. And it came from deep within you. You felt much more energy. You felt more vital. And so it, for me, vitality is, it runs through the whole system. The whole system is involved. It's involved in the relationship we have with ourselves. It's involved in the relationship we have with the world. It's involved with the relationship and the interactions that we're having all the time. It's involved in our lifestyle. It's involved with the food that we're taking. So for me it's how how we metabolize all these things affects our vitality and if we get a we we'll call it a blockage a toxin an illness if we take a concept in yoga like viadi you know it, it's a disease if we get that it stops it reduces our vitality if we're lazy okay the worst thing in the world is being a lazy bones you know, it's just like, come on, let's go, let's go, let's go for a walk, let's have some fun. The person's going, oh, I can't move. And you're like, you don't move, come on, let's move. You know, there's this kind of, it stops, it, 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 it kind of erodes the vitality. Doubt. You know, if someone doubts something, in, in yoga, doubt's an interesting thing, because it, it's, it's called samshaya, but I, I, I say to people, it's a 24-hour battle doubt because what happens is that when you have doubt you know shall i shall i go into stanford or shall i stay at home shall i do this shall i do that it, it's there's this kind of this movement it consumes your energy because remember that what you take your attention to you put energy to it so you can put energy your mind to your disease and you can connect your mind to your disease and you can magnify the intensity of that. You can give energy to that. You can direct your prana, your life force, your vitality to the disease because you connect to it and you link with it. So actually you feed, you feed the wrong thing. So for me, when we're discussing this, um, I'm starting to kind of think about how we you know what considerations we need to consider vitality to enhance vitality because if we're hasty or if we're doubtful or if we direct our mind towards the wrong thing almost we consume our life force we chip away at those years as you were saying Stanford at the end of our life you know because we want to have a good quality of life I don't know, what do you think of, am I? Well, one of my first thoughts is, okay, next round these for doubt then. That will be a good topic. Um, <laughs> I think it will be a very interesting conversation. Um, I, about, I think you- about doubt. Hmm? about doubt. Yeah, that will yeah. be an interesting conversation. Um, interesting <laughs> topic. I, I think in response to that, and I think almost kind of answering Carol's question a little bit, she was asking if there's a balance um, in vitality as we're talking about it, and especially to my stories. I think I kind of relate to Paul's definition a little bit where, so my patient at the moment, the one I've seen today, that's, he definitely has almost like a barrier to the world where he kind of rejects his interaction with the world. He doesn't want to be understood. He's unwilling to let go of certain parts of himself to be understood. And at the same time, he whatever interaction he's getting from others, he kind of just swallow it and keep saying that he doesn't care about it and he don't want to think about it and he don't want to kind of, as Colin's saying, digest and assimilate into himself. And at the same time, his relationship with himself is very much rejected as well, because whatever thoughts or feelings that is bubbling up, he wants to just press them down and say that it'll be fine. He will take a deep breath, not think about it, and it'll be gone. So I think he's very much rejecting on both counts. I think he's definitely one extreme of, it, of the spectrum. And I think the other extreme of the spectrum will be when someone's so elated, and I will almost use the word manic when they are like as Colin was saying, the, the expansiveness kind of got so out of proportion where it, it impacts on functionality, where you, yes, you become the light in the room, but you burn so bright that no one else can see a bloody thing. Um, I, think, I think that kind of state is probably not a balanced use of your vitality as well. You, uh, 
you you want to you want to burn bright enough i often think you know if you if you imagine your life is like a match state you want to burn bright enough so that you can see enough around you but not so bright that you've gone in a flash that's kind of how i often imagine it and i don't know why but as i was saying that i i i suddenly remember a lot of the celebrities who die very young you know that's the analogy i come i get from is you know, some people just burn so bright for such a short period of time and they kind of exceeded their limits and they have to leave us and and in some way that coming to the chinese medicine perspective that that is we we are born with a certain amount of vitality and sometimes it can be limited by our genetic inher inheritance like how when and when and how we're conceived when we are born who our parents are heritage are like how much of a kind of like a reserve we are naturally born with and that vitality they often said is um either can be qi or jing or jing shen um they often store in the kidney because that is the organ that they say kind of help us to grow hair and bones that is teeth nails that that is the organ that kind of stems where um where our vitality stem from sorry and it's determined uh, determined at birth but what kind of chips away illness and sickness is definitely one but the other one that i was saying how the western medicine is slowly coming to terms with is also being too emotional and also overworked so the stress and emotion uh, as well as other stuff like diets alcohol smoking weight sleeping exercise um personality environment and entertainment these kind of all plays a part as well but very, very importantly, as always, Chinese medicine link everything into emotion and they say actually keeping calm and that steadiness and that stability is very important. And I think now that I'm practicing in psychiatry, I can I can see that. And I think I think our NHS is recognizing that as well, because I think just in the last few years where NHS recognized um, patients with mental health issues or mental health disorder, their natural lifespan is often shorter. I think they're shorter by about a decade, more or less. And, and it's quite significant and it kind of shows that that over exurbance of their emotions or their psychology somehow seems to kind of burn away or chip away their vitality a little bit. Um, I can give you a whole list of how, how what they kind of what Chinese medicine advise um, in terms of uh, each season what you like, need to do like less anger during spring because that is like a liver and wood energy so on and so forth but I think in short it's just in general don't kind of overexert yourself emotionally speaking because yes you want to be heard and you need to be heard and you need to express yourself clearly but maybe also at the same time not shouting all the time Colin what do you say to that or the NHS goal well what's what's coming to me is that vitality is actually a natural functioning it's the natural functioning of the body mind heart complex it's actually natural functioning and one thing that we do is that we erode that natural functioning or we block that natural functioning either physically or mentally so we start to it, it's a little like um i spoke to someone this morning and they said i'm just so tired i'm just so exhausted can we can we lie down? I didn't want to lie down with them, but it's just that you know. And so I said, well, "What have you been doing?" Well, I just I just feel absolutely exhausted. I feel really, really exhausted. I feel really emotional. And for me, this link between emotion which is what you were saying, things like depression, which takes away your power, it takes away your energy, it, take, it steals from you. There's something happening that is taking your vitality. And for me, all yoga practices, breathing, gentle movement, the development of breathing and movement, focusing and beginning to focus the mind on parts of the body positive things touching the body working with mantras visualizations 
preparing the mind for meditation. All of these things are about beginning to get the vital functions of the body back and mind back online again, the way that that's the function of it. You know, this is the tools of yoga are all associated with the natural functioning of the body. They go along with the natural functioning of the body. So if you think about physical positions, they're about helping the body function. If you think about breathing, it's about extending the life force within the system. It's about harnessing the life force in the system. If you think about meditation techniques, it's about directing the mind in a positive way. So it's about getting the functioning, the vital functioning of the system up and running again. And then what we're looking at doing is enhancing that vitality. So we're looking to increase the vitality so that actually what we can do is get use these tools for optimal vital functioning. So what I see when I see when I work in clinic and I see case studies and people come in and, and, it, and someone can come in exhausted, like I had two people today exhausted, right, completely exhausted, two different reasons. One person, depression. Another person, so what did you do? I drank half a bottle of wine last night. Oh, did you? And so what's the effect? Do you see what I mean? So you get this kind of, there is an effect to these things that you put in the system and that affects the vitality of the system. Like what you mentioned, Stanford, with regard to alcohol, what we put into the system, food, liquids, all these different things affect the system. So for me, what you're saying um, in, in, in Western medicine and also on the, on the Chinese side, I, you know, I, I think we're all saying the same thing. I think that we're saying that the body actually has and its nature is to be vital. And if we come to look at um, life cycle, I was, again, I was speaking with someone else earlier today about this, is that at an early age, we tend to have this kind of compressed vitality as we want to grow. So we kind of, you know, up until the age of sort of 15, 16, 17, we're kind of like expanding like this. There's this sort of real vitality. We had some, some children staying over the weekend um, and they were running around absolutely everywhere to keep warm, admittedly, because we didn't have any electricity, but they were running around absolutely everywhere. But you, and they've got this sort of like this and then they crash and then they get up again and run around everywhere and then they crash and you just sit there watching them going, oh, my God, I used to be like that. Did I know I was never like that? You know, I never had that much energy. I didn't climb walls like that. Did you No. You know, so there was, you know, there's this kind of natural energy, expansive energy with child. And then that energy, I, I, when I'm looking at anti-aging and I'm looking at sort of like in the mid stage of life, like where we're looking to maintain and protect what we've got, we're actually looking at this stage of life, a mid stage of life to maintain our energy, to protect our energy, to make sure we don't waste our energy. So that actually, as we start to get older and older, there's a natural degeneration of the system, but and almost that our vitality starts to be lost. I was discussing this with someone earlier today um, about the sadness associated with the realization that there's these changes that occur and there's a change in our vitality. And there's a change in what's happening with our body and how do we keep everything together? How do we maintain it as we start to get towards the end of our life? Which is where we started at the beginning of today, Stanford, which is towards the end of life, is that there's this loss of vitality. I, I think that's definitely a sadness whenever there's a loss of that physical vitality where you're physically less able and, mm. and there's always a grief and there's always a mourning about it. And hopefully at some stage at that mourning and grief, you come to acceptance or come to accept a little bit more that this is the new norm and this is the mm. new state. But at the same time, I, I felt like there, there should be hope as well. Um, so incidentally, I was listening to a Chinese podcast today uh, where the host interviews at, like basically a fashionista 
quite a key fashionista figure from in Hong Kong, and she's at the moment 60 something. And she, she was answering exactly that question. How do we deal with aging? How do we deal with uh, the fading of our lives and life meanness? And she said, one, exercise is important. You need to keep moving as you grow older, you, especially if you want to keep in a certain figure, if you want to feel great about yourself, not feeling so stuck, exercise, you know, proportionally is always very, very important. But then she said something very important, and I think it's quite true, is age is just a number. There, yes, there are people who are 20 something, 30 something who looks great and who feels great, but there are actually also people who are 20 something and 30 something who looks, pardon my phrase, look like shit. So age is a number and there are people who are 60 something who looks great as well. So how you carry yourself and how you, or how we, sorry, how we carry ourselves and how we treat our life and how we hold ourselves in a society and kind of hold ourselves to ourselves is very important and and she for from her wisdom that, that I'm going to share because I don't think I live quite as much as her and quite as well as her is the curiosity she maintained her curiosity and she keep having that spark so to speak keep she keep wanting to learn she keep wanting to participate to work to engage to interact and maybe it is in her innate ability or maybe it's taught by her parents, maybe it's her job or her life experience. But I think maybe it's also something that we can all aspire to do, to find that thing that sparks our curiosity, our eagerness to keep learning. Because I think after reading everything that I've researched about, vitality, yes, physical vitality is important, and but almost is also the most basic you know, kind of like in coming back to Freud's, you know, pyramid of human need, like satisfying the um, physical need is the most basic thing. You know, you just want to have warm view, warm food, uh, want a bit of sex probably, uh, because reproduction is also important. But then actually the emotional and spiritual development, that is kind of the ever going quest. And having a bit more focus and having a bit more... Um, exploring in that direction is often good. So that's what I kind of found from my research. It's, um, it's interesting because uh, what I, I like is that um, I like the fact that with regard to attitude and with regard to how we come to live it affects our vitality and that is to do with our intention and our purpose in life which is what you discussed earlier i also like that that what's happening is that for us as yogis it's through the pulse that we actually feel the reality and the quality of the vitality of prana within the body. So part of our work when we're coming to work with people, so someone will tell me they're exhausted and I'll feel their pulse and I'll be able to understand. Firstly, a number of things. I'll be able to understand, is it physical exhaustion or is it mental exhaustion? If it's physical exhaustion, where in the body, so where within the vata, pitta, or kappa within the body are these things happening? So what's going on? So for me, there are signs not just on the outside, but there are also signs on the inside about what's happening and how vitality is working inside the body. question of how to maintain vitality is it a natural thing is it something that you have to work on for me i think that we have to work on vitality i think we have to really maintain what we have i think we have to work at it we have to put a lot of effort into it especially in our society today 
I think we need to be firmer with our boundaries. I think that we need to connect more with the natural world around us. I think that we need to look at the boundaries of our relationships. This is my opinion, um, and this is what I've seen a lot of. Um, and I also believe that I also believe, like you, there's a lot of hope, a lot of hope when you're working with people. Yeah. Um, as first of all, I want to correct as well. The hierarchy of needs is actually by Maslow, is not Freud. I think Freud has similar theories, but the hierarchy is from Maslow. Um, and I think coming to the angle of rather we can revitalize ourselves. <sighs> I, 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 because it's from the great wisdom of our ancestors, I will, I will have to believe them in saying that vitality is something that we're born with and not something that we can give by ourselves, by human ourselves. It's something that is just innately there. But at the same time, I think the hope is just like Colin is saying, kind of, we're kind of like a slightly enlarged version of children. Yes, we can deplete ourselves into such a state. But once you kind of had a little bit of rest, you can actually find the vitality again. So even, I don't know, even or oh, I misspoke you, we have gone a little bit wrong with alcohol and diet and rest and work and stress and emotion and whatever it may be, there is still hope that you can regain that. And I'm not just saying this because I want to be hopeful and ending on a positive note, but also because at the moment I'm actually working in a substance misuse service um, where there are a lot of, um, people who are addicts, people who are dependent on alcohol, recreational drugs, sometimes both, either currently or in the past. And there are examples where they really have to plead themselves of their vitality because of the addiction. And by definition, you kind of lost sight of everything else in life. You, you're only addicted to that one substance, which is most of the time harmful, creating a harmful effect on you and you're still carrying on with it. But actually, I see recovered addicts where they come back and they regain their vitality. Yes. Would they would their vitality and energy and lifespan be longer and better if they haven't gone through that phase properly? But at the same time, I think there is still hope that you can, there's always a chance they can come back. So yeah, I, I'm gonna end today, at least on my portion, on the slightly positive notes. I, I've seen it happen and it is possible, but maybe not completely reversible. And from my perspective, with vitality, you can fully participate in life. Is it kind of weird that we're so both so positive at the end of the webinar? <laughs> well, I, I'll take it. Let, we, you know, we can cut to a different ending. So you know, now you need to do a different ending, and I can, and then and then you can choose which ending you want. <laughs> Thank you very much everyone for your participation especially more than usual and it really really made it lovely to share my thoughts and research tonight um colin what we are doing next week on next week next time actually an amazing subject matter um water my favorite and yeah. this one you can definitely blame on me no no, no. This, this it's a very interesting subject matter because it, it's it's not quite as clear cut as we think it is. So I'm, I'm actually quite excited to, to do water. Great. Right. So thank you very much for joining. Have a good evening and looking forward to see you next time. Thank you so much, guys. Take care. Bye.